if you have EEG, you can really predict the development of the patient and please take into account towards both outcomes, poor and good, and that's quite new. When we are looking at the EEG, we can end up with birth suppression and then birth suppression doesn't equal birth suppression. On this part of the slide, you have uh, polymorphous bursts and you see here the quantitative analysis is quite heterogeneous. And here you have identical bursts and uh, it's more monotonous here. And these ones are highly predictive of poor outcome. Uh, they occur in about 10% of post-cardiac arrest patients. Let's come to reactivity. Some examples here uh, taken from patients during TTM and sedation. Here, a continuous background that is interrupted by clapping hands uh, next to the patient. Here are slowed background that accelerates upon uh, noxious stimulus at the middle of the page. And here, at first glance, you say, well, there is a somehow alpha activity, maybe of higher amplitude in the frontal leads, but look, there is no reactivity. Uh, upon um, painful stimulation, this is an alpha coma, so pretending a poor outcome. So you see that continuity of the background is important, but you have somehow to integrate with uh, reactivity. Reactivity is a very challenging and debating issue. So present reactivity has been linked to uh, uh, anticipation of good outcome with a nice sensitivity of about 80% uh, across time, you see here. Look at an example here. This patient had periodic discharges, it's a reduced montage on a theta background, and then you apply a, a painful stimulus and uh, the background changes. So that's, that's good. If you see that, please try to treat the patient, especially if brainstem reflexes are there, if SSCP uh, cortical uh, responses are, uh, are there. And that's quite a, a, a good uh, myoclonus is not equal myoclonus. You have the most prevalent type of it, which is uh, characterized by suppressed background with a uh, higher voltage, very high voltage superimposed polyspikes that are diffused and time locked with the myoclonus. And on the other side, a proportion of patients that show uh, somehow uh, a continuous background with uh, uh, lower voltage, midline centered uh, repetitive spikes, like here. The former is the malignant form, and the latter is a precursor of Lance Adams syndrome, a post anoxic myoclonus, which is fully compatible with uh, awakening. The later you recover, the higher percentage of poor outcome. And then, time to epileptiform EG, the earlier you show epileptiform uh, uh, patterns, the worse the prognosis. Keep in mind, during TTM, we have propofol. And so if despite that, you see a, a repetitive epileptiform discharge, that's a bad sign, meaning that the aggression to the brain is very heavy, is very um, important. We uh, recently came out with a score that has been validated uh, in Boston. We had two cohorts uh, for patients with early epileptiform EEGs after cardiac arrest. The score the eponym is Nectaros you have an early score during TTM, a late score after TTM. Non-epileptic form discharge gives you one point. Continuity, uh, more than 50% of the trace, one point. Reactivity at the two time points, two points. Um, the background amplitude of the late AG, one point, uh, and the stimulus-induced patterns, also one point. So you have to from zero to six, and actually the our area under the curve is, is very good. We have a score of uh, at least two to identify with good sensitivity patient that will awaken at three months and a score of at least three, four identifies good outcome patients. And also somehow reassuring the higher the score, the lower the NSC. So looking that uh, the, there is a correlation with uh, the extent of neuronal damage. And talking about correlation, we have a, a relationship between EEG and MRI. And if you have an EEG that is continuous, despite you know post anoxic myoclonus and an MRI with no or very limited uh, alteration in diffusion-weighted imaging, the uh, 
sensitivity and specificity for good outcome is very high. This is also a recent work from these centers. Um, what do you do if you have identified these patients? Again, it's about maybe five to 10% of patients with post-anoxic uh, um, uh, encephalopathy and coma, NTEG, so 30% of patients with post-anoxic encephalopathy have uh, uh, status epilepticus, and 10% of these, meaning maybe two to, to three percent of the whole cohort, may be amenable to a, to a, uh, improving uh, to awakening. You use, and you can add, uh, depending on the on the uh, evolution, some uh, general anesthetics. It takes time to awaken. You see, the median is about 12 days, and uh, I wouldn't go beyond two to three weeks. Uh, uh, despite that. So it, it makes no sense going on for months and months. So EG, you see reactivity and continuity correlates with NSE. Okay, that's good since we are multimodal. And that's also reassuring in terms of self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you use a tool to predict the outcome uh, and then you assess the predictive performance of the tool, uh, of course, there is a self-fulfilling issue. But if several tools go into the same direction, that's quite reassuring. So reactivity EEG is mostly related with a nice looking MRI, continuity also less strikingly and not so striking for epileptic form discharges, by the way. And uh, you see the, the highly malignant patterns are strongly related to ugly looking MRIs. A benign EG, meaning continuous and reactive, is invariable, almost invariably linked to present SSCP. So you can maybe get rid of the SSCP in these patients. That's good to know. Uh, can save some time. Um, and the last paper that I found really important, and they looked at uh, autopsy uh, um, uh, of brain of patient that unfortunately died after cardiac arrest, and they had severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy patient with no severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So meaning that they are woke, but actually they, they, they died because of, of another reason or patient with um, intermediately uh, severe uh, um, encephalopathy. We look at the continuity here. It doesn't discriminate between these two conditions of between severity, but reactivity does. So you see the combination of those as we have seen until now is probably important and highly malignant pattern, once again, strongly related to a severe histo histological alteration. Uh, Joseph and colleagues showed that uh, in, in adults, it's very rare to have midline uh, seizures. So you catch up seizures uh, better in this very reduced montage with the cerebral uh, um, uh, arrangement. And uh, this is work from Pittsburgh again, continuous versus uh, spot EG. Continuous EG is better to identify prognostic events, but not, it's not better to identify potentially treatable seizure. Actually, seizure go on for a long time. So if you make a spot EG, we'll catch them. It was alluded to, you see they, uh, patients uh, with any uh, alteration of consciousness, uh, were uh, just one third of, of those had uh, cardiac arrest, but by far not everybody, were randomized to one time continuous EEG, 30 to 48 hours versus two repeated routine EEG of 20 minutes. And then we had an outcome assessment at six months to make a long history short, no difference in, in mortality. There was also no difference in, in uh, terms of uh, uh, functional outcome, by the way. So there is no hard signal that using that continuous EEG improves prognosis. We had a first continuous EEG after 18 hours. Now, E warms a little bit up. Uh, there is a residual midazolam. It's, it's stopped, but you know, the half-life is long. We have a slow EEG that reacts uh, on stimulation. Okay, now the conclusion. Now, for the time being, I think uh, performing an EEG, either continuous or spot EEG, it's important to make it during and after TTM because it can inform on both directions. And you look at these items and then you have to always be interdisciplinary and multimodal in your decision. Uh, wait a 
enough for enough time and allow several weeks to this patient, this subgroup of patient that can uh, maybe awaken despite status epileptic or, or myoclonia. 